It's a pleasure for me to discuss with you some aspects of laser spectroscopy in environmental monitoring. The field of environmental monitoring is very nicely connected actually to the field of uh, biomedical optics, and we do both things. In the next talk, uh, Katarina Swanberg will talk about the biomedical optics. It's mostly a question about the size of the optics, but for a physicist, it's very much the same uh, things you are doing. So uh, Lund, as you know, is not too far from here. It's uh, about 15 kilometers from the third largest city of Sweden, Malmö, and we are nicely connected over to Copenhagen. That's our airport. It takes 40 minutes from Lund by train to the airport, actually. And we are part of Laser Lab Europe here at the Lund Laser Center. Um, and uh, it's also a pleasure to see that the uh, Laser Center and the University of Latvia is also part of this network. And, um, you know, talking about linking countries, two countries that were always at war with each other, Sweden and Denmark. You know, change or things are getting better, and we hope that will happen in the whole world, actually, to make these links rather than separations. <laughs> I worked with laser radar techniques for a very long time. And for me, uh, laser radar monitoring kilometer range, measuring sulfur dioxide from a volcanic plume, or to find a tumor in a female breast. That's the same project. It's laser radar at different ranges. You know, that's the philosophy of the physicist. So what you can do is transmit pulses out into the atmosphere uh, with a tunable laser tune the radiation to a wavelength where a particular molecule is absorbing and look how much comes back. And then you tune off that wavelength where it does not absorb and see how much comes back. And if the gas is there, less comes back if uh, uh, you hit that cloud of that. So that's a differential absorption you do. And in that way, you can put on your magic glasses so you now see the world in atomic mercury. You see, there is a plume of mercury from this factory in Italy. Um, downwind atomic mercury is emitted from the electrolytical cells here. And we capture that 250 meters away. And you can see it extends up less than 100 meters in the air. Or you go to Italy and put uh, the system on the off deck of a research vessel, fire vertically up under the plume of Mount Etna, the largest volcano in Europe. And up there at three kilometers height, you see that there is a difference in the backscattering depending on if you sit on absorption of SO2 or off absorption of SO2, less light is coming back. By dividing the two curves, you cancel out all the unknown and you can get the concentration as a function of range. It's a very practical technique indeed. So we pursued that quite a lot with different types of systems in Sweden. And both Katarina and I worked actually for about 10 years at a center in Guangzhou, uh, where we also uh, implemented these type of techniques now with a, not a Volvo truck, but on a Jiefeng truck. Jiefeng in Chinese means liberation. Now that's a very big truck company over there. And of course, as always in China, in Sweden, or in Latvia, uh, the equipment is not the important thing. The important thing are the, import, are the people. And these are the students. And all of them either made their PhD with us in China or on our PhDs uh, some other where in the world after <laughs> finishing their three-year master student. The system can be docked to the building here to transmit the light via vertically looking telescope onto the telescope into the atmosphere. Backscatter light is connected by the telescope. and um, you then get into the electronics. So basically here, you bring all equipment along, anything that you can do in the fixed laboratory, you could do anywhere in China and so on with the, you know, the proper electric supply. Uh, this is an example of monitoring atomic mercury in a very poor province of China, Guizhou. There is a lot of mining, there's a lot of pollution and so on. Mercury mines are there, now abandoned, like in most parts of the world, because of the problem with mercury. Mercury has a very high vapor pressure, and because of that, there are fumes of that, but always at a low concentration. The only reason we can see atomic mercury, uh, which is a one part in 10 to the 12 in the atmosphere, PPT, 
Nu har man inte spipit B nu, så för det också är då PPM even. But this is PPT is because it's an atom. And atoms, you know, have very simple energy level diagrams. So all the oscillator strength is sort of sitting in a single transition. So we are a thousand times more sensitive for mercury than for anything else, actually. And you can see here in these mining areas here where we see the differential absorption sitting on the absorption line and off the absorption line, dividing the two curves. It's a slope. It would not be a slope, it would be horizontal if there wouldn't be any gas, because then it would doesn't make any difference if I sit on or off the line. But it makes a difference, and actually the concentration as a function of range is about 100 times higher than the Atlantic background. So it's quite polluted. You can do a lot of pollution monitoring like this, but you can also do some very interesting geophysical work or even archaeological work. And a long dream we had and prepared for a long time till it finally became possible was to go to Xi'an, where the Qin Shi Huangdi, the emperor who unified China 200 before Christ, built his marvelous tube. This is the important thing. And we don't hear much about that. We always hear about the Terracotta Army. This has never been open, you know, and it would be a fantastic thing. But according to the chronicles, there would be maybe a hundred tons of liquid mercury in the tomb chamber, the elixir of life in those days. And with the high vapor pressure, our thinking was that due to cracks up here during more than 2000 years, there might be a seeping up mercury, like a halo sitting on top of that. That would, you know, verify the chronicles by Sima, the historian who wrote about that. They constructed this with 600,000 people for 38 years. And it's a very modest man um, to make his monument here. And indeed, on top of the halo, there is a halo of mercury. The differential absorption curve is going down. It's not flat. So that was a very interesting experience. Of course, you can measure pollutants and in particular also mercury with simpler equipment. And this is actually a uh, optical device. It's a commercial device that we use tra transporting in a car, just in the back seat, <coughs> sucking in gas and doing differential absorption by Zeeman modulation on the strong uh, mercury line. It was actually the mercury line that Alnis showed from Lund with the isotopic components, even the 254 nanometer line here. You see them and modulate that, so one component gets into absorption, the other doesn't, and you become extremely sensitive by this correlation technique. And going through the city of Guangzhou, we saw that, uh, you know, sometimes it's a normal concentration, not uh, much difference from what we have in Scandinavia. But, you know, in uh, rush traffic, it increases a lot. You have the same scale here. The places where you see a lot of mercury, that's indoor. Old chemistry labs where people fooled around with mercury and hospitals where they always are pretty careless in terms of old thermometers and so on. So this is from a hospital in China and you can see huge, huge, enormous concentrations of mercury there. And it's very easy to get rid of that with magnesium powder also once you know it. So it's a good example for how simple technology can you know improve the environment? These things are examples of optics in scattering media. We get signal back because of scattering against particles, or uh, you know, me scattering, or against the uh, major molecules like nitrogen. And uh, scattering is a very common thing. Like in the atmosphere <laughs> around the sun, we might see a halo when we have a you know fog like that. You might shine the laser through a slice of apple. You see something very similar. And the physics is identical. It's just different scales. Or through a pharmaceutical tablet. That's a particularly nice thing because we got maybe a million euro from AstraZeneca to shine on tablets and find out about you know, porosity and things like that. Or you can do it through the uh, biological tissue where we are particularly transparent. Katharina will talk more about that. So interestingly, you use this type of scattering on different scales. You can use that in LIDAR, light detection arranging, 
in kilometer radius to look for the backscattering coming back. Or you can transmit it through some little structure or millimeter range, like we do here, CW radiation, it backscatters into the detector. Here we have the diode lasers that the Yanis Alvis was talking about before here, scan through and see the absorption features, second derivative as a matter of fact, by lock-in techniques, tobacco is very sensitive. So, you know, in LIDAR, we would use to pick the particles to scatter against particles. And then we see the gas in between, but it's also possible to go into a solid where you have pores, vacuoles like that. And then we instead see the gas, which is inside the small bubbles or the pores. We call that gas in scattering media absorption spectroscopy. And it turned out to be a very fruitful way of doing studies. So the general idea is like this. You take some sample, might be wood or Swiss cheese or something with the holes inside. And if you tune the laser, it's all solid state, dull things, very slow dependence on wavelength because it's a perturbed situation in solid state. But if you enter the gas, the free gas, you get the needle stitch, which is 10,000 times sharper and very weak, but we can see that by modulation techniques. Or we can do it in backscattering like that and put the detector at the same time to look for this very sharp signal. We've become pretty good at look, looking at such sharp signals by monitoring air pollutants in the atmosphere. And we've become very good at understanding all this scattering garbage, which destroys everything from biophotonics. You see again, the combination between the two areas. And where do you find that? Well, in pharmaceutical tablets, in fruits, in uh, ceramics, in wood, uh, any food stuffs like that, or in the human body. This is one example here. This is uh, maybe the most famous thing in archaeology we have in Sweden, the Vasa ship. Now, this is a very good example on never make any war or go around with armies and stuff. It's stupid things. We were very proud and the king put this out and it sailed exactly 200 meters before it sank, right? You know, if you do bad, you end up bad, right? It's a good example. And you can see here how we made a study on this type of wood because, you know, it's decaying, of course, in many ways. So you can look at, for instance, uh, wood, which is filled with water, and when it dries, you create free gas. Before, solid water has very slow structures, but when you put water vapor, you get these needle stitches. And you can see how the oxygen from the atmosphere penetrates in. So you can look at the details of drying. And that's interesting because you know everything needs to be dried. Uh, enormous energy and so on for drying wood, the drying grains, the drying whatever, houses. And you can follow that as a function of time here, a long time, and see how water vapor and oxygen signal is changing. It's also possible to use this type of multiple scattering, say in non-porous materials. It's a very small piece here. It's about like a lump of sugar. And we send light in from one side, but it's hopeless for the light to get out because of this massive multiple scattering you have in there. Uh, it looks like it's five meters long, although it's so small. And that means, of course, you get a very long path length and become extremely sensitive. So in that way, we can monitor air pollutants, for instance, this diffuse into that and make the world's cheapest and simplest multipass cell. In that, like that, a lump of sugar instead of these precision mirrors to arrange to make the light go back and forth. Let's go over to <coughs> monitoring, say, water and the vegetation and stuff. You can do that also. And now we use laser induced fluorescence instead, where we might get general uh, signals from uh, all types of, of crap in the water here. You can get signals from uh, um, chlorophyll, from the algae, and there is a water ramen signal from the liquid water also. Or on vegetation, you see strong signals in the red wavelength region because of chlorophyll. And the ratio between these two peaks tells you about the concentration of chlorophyll. You can bring that out into the field like this here. 
monitoring of the mice fields in the Henan province in China. That's the cradle of civilization, Yellow River, uh, where it's all started, more or less civilization and so on. And we directed the beams onto this area, got the signals remotely, but took the leaves into the laboratory and did this stuff of studies. Interestingly, frequently it is, sorry, uh, you know, when you look at this type of spectra, you say, well, they all look the same. And that was our experience with Katarina also in medicine. All spectra look the same. So can you do anything? You know, yes, you can still do because they are not quite the same, especially if you analyze it with multiv multivariate analysis and principal component. So we were able to distinguish many different types of, of mice and rice and so on by looking at these, you know, it's more or less like quantum mechanics where you expand a wave function into orthogonal basis functions. That's the same philosophy. Um, okay, heavy systems, but light systems are even better. And of course in China, a lot of drones are made in the neighboring city of Shenzhen. Uh, that's where many are fabricated actually. And so we made a very compact system here with a CW laser like the one I have in my hand here, transmitted that downwards from the drone, imaged the line down from the side on an imaging detector and with tri triangulation, it's then possible also to get the range resolution and crossed to that, we have a spectrometer. So we see the fluorescence signature as a function of range by reading out this detector. So we see the trees outside our laboratory. We fly back and forth uh, under GPS control. And we see the tree and the concentration of chlorophyll in the leaves and in the grass on the ground as we are flying along here. See the typical chlorophyll signal as you can see here. That can also be brought up and be flown over water. This is the, not the Daugava, could have been, <laughs> but it is the Pearl River, the Chujiang in Guangzhou. And uh, our students became pilots of, uh, of, of these type of things. I like that very much, actually. And this is even simpler system because it's just a blue light emitting diode shining down. And then we image the spot on the surface with a very simple compact spectrometer. And you get beautiful spectra. And of course, it's infinitely cheaper than flying a helicopter or anything like that. And you get a lot of information about water pollutants. You can even make even more compact things, a handheld little device like this. And then you point at something and then you get the quality of the water that you're pointing at, or you point at some vegetation or some apple on the tree, and you get information on that by fluorescence or reflectance spectroscopy. Talking about small handheld devices, we discussed the other uh, day. A uh, few words about uh, monitoring of big particles in the air. Uh, small particles are called pollutants. Big particles are called insects or birds. <laughs> and if you can see the small particles, it would be trivial to see the big particles, wouldn't it? And for some reason, people didn't do that much. But um, there was a group in Montana who started, and we very quickly caught up with that in Lund. And why would you uh, look at insects? Why would they be interested? Because pollinators, we do our best, of course, to kill them all by pesticides. But if we don't have the pollinators, there would be very little on our plate to eat, as a matter of fact. And we have the deadly disease vectors from uh, malaria, Zika virus, uh, uh, whatever. And of course, all these agricultural pests who eat the food away from a starving world. So it makes a lot of sense to try to monitor that. And we started that, you know, with big stuff here in Sweden, with the big system we have there shooting onto the mirror and the beam is folded, goes half a meter over the river. And every time a little guy like this flies into the beam, we see the blip, the coffee drinking students see the blip on the computers. This is quite some time ago, even look at the computer screens, you see? <laughs> so this has been around for some time now. And the general idea is you fire the laser, right? And here the pulse goes to the ultraviolet, induces fluorescence, fluorescence in different colors. And you capture that in 
different detectors. So each behind a certain filter. And that means you get a fingerprint of the guy flying over. It has to show its passport to students in the bus. And uh, that's, of course, infinitely more simple to do than running around with a Siva, Donald Duck, to catch the butterflies, right? So it's sort of a revolution in the field of uh, uh, this area. But again, you should have smaller equipment. And uh, a student of mine, Mikkel Brydegård, first had this idea to use the CW lasers. And here we use um, cheap Chinese CW lasers, uh, $100 for two watt output power, it cost nothing. You know, 15 years ago, it would cost 100 or 1,000 times more. That's a revolution. What do you use? Not the expensive lenses we use in science. We buy down the street the astronomical tubes, you know, for amateur astronomy. They cost nothing. So the whole system you see here costs 10,000 US dollars. And we send out the beam. We look with a telescope at an angle along the beam, get a good range resolution at close range, of course, and far range less. And we have a tilted detector on that. And by tilting the detector, we get a sharp image close and far away. You know, the old fashioned cameras, when we wanted to photograph something close, we pull out the lens to get a sharp image, and otherwise we pull it back. But by tilting the detector, you do it for all ranges at the same time. So you get sharp. And that means that we can, in a simple way, monitor over rivers, for instance, or over a lake. And this is a paper we are just publishing, actually. Uh, and uh, what would you see then? You read out, you know, any insect flying through where it makes a blip. This is where we are sitting close to the system. And this is the termination on the other side of the river where we, for safety, stop the beam on the screen over there. And the river is running about two meters above the sea level. So each of these blips is an is insect flying in, very strong. And you can read out a thousand times per second. And if you do that, you can even see how they have the wings. You see the wing big flapping, which is again the passport showing who is flying there to a certain extent. And we found out here, very interesting thing, going in the evening here, you can see each of these blips here is an insect. So during a night, you see 100,000 insects being recorded rather than catching a single butterfly. So they like that, the people in this area. And you can see a lot of sociology here. Uh, the small ones don't want to supply over the, uh, the lake. It's all the big ones who do that. And you can see a lot of things, how uh, they uh, uh, behave. In China, we did that over rice fields. You can see here with the same type of setup. Here we had two lasers with opposite polarization and detected polarization sensitive. That means that you become sensitive to the structure. If it's a shiny insect or if it's a hairy insect, if you get uh, on a water droplet, you see you get linear polarization back according to the me theory. But if it's you know a rough thing, it gets depolarized, and that's again a way to get more information about these agricultural pests which are flying over there. So here you can follow them over 24 hours, see how many you have at dawn, you know, then they are coming all in the evening. Uh, and uh, you can see that clear. also in the morning that happens. You can measure the wing beat frequency, do the Fourier analysis for uh, Rashid Ganyev. I could say we have seen the 29th overtone of the wing beat frequency, <laughs> talking about high harmonics and so on. So, you know, the analysis is of course, very similar. And you can see how the wing bit frequencies changes as a function of time over day, which means that different populations are flying. This can be done also in the compact devices like traps, where you have pheromones to attract them. These are very dangerous uh, 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 malaria and Zika virus. The big ones, the females, the females are the dangerous ones. You know, only the females, they are dangerous. Uh -huh. uh, the males, not so much. And you can see how they go through the detector and flap their wings. And you can see that the males and females have different 
frequencies, um, actually, as you can see here, and uh, different, but as we discussed the other way, with strong overlap in frequency, even for the same species and between males and females. So uh, on the other hand, mosquitoes are always around 500 hertz, so butterfly might be 20 or 40. So there is a, a possibility to distinguish things. Interestingly, you not, don't even need a laser to do these things. You can use the natural sun. If you take a telescope here, a very cheap telescope for $200 or less, you look with a telescope into nothing, into a black box. Now, the more black it is, the more interesting it is. Normally, it's not so interesting to look into something black. You see nothing. Exactly. You see nothing. Except if one of these guys fly into the field of view, and then you get a sun dance flash in your eyes and see the echo. And if you expand that in time and read out the detector quickly, you see how they flap their wings with a fundamental first overtone, next overtone, and so on, make the Fourier spectrum of that. Um, birds can also be seen. And we did quite a lot of studies on that with different techniques. Laser radar, they fly at night. Many people are interested in looking at birds, of course, but the most interesting thing is to look at night because that's when they are moving to Africa. And that's uh, at and one or two kilometers high and it's hard to see them, but we can see them. And by inducing fluorescence in the belly, we might see some information about who is flying over there. And you can do infrared imaging, you can do uh, uh, occultation, some people call this uh, exoplanet detection. It's the same thing when a bird flies in front of the moon, right? Less light is coming, and you can see they flap their wings, you know, in the absence of moonlight, and so on. So it's quite interesting. We come, we come to the end here now. Uh, you do the same thing in water, much shorter distances, maybe 5, 10 meters. You can see the legs of the shrimp moving, Again, some identification on that. And uh, well, this and almost everything else you can read in this book, just two months ago, the fifth edition of my book came out. And um, it's, uh, you know, up to date. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>